All right, so we're still in chapter 23 and we're picking up with slide number 39. So we just finished talking about the nasal cavity, um, the pharynx and the larynx. And going down in the respiratory uh, pathway, we now get to the trachea, which is often called the windpipe. It is a tough but very flexible tube and it starts from below the cricoid cartilage and goes down to the mediastinum and where it then branches into a right branch and a left branch that we call the primary bronchi, right bronchus and left bronchus. It has a submucosal layer, which is a layer of connective tissue, and it goes underneath or, or surrounding the mucosal layer. And in the submucosa, we have tracheal glands that add even more mucus to our mix. It also has a really unusual feature. It has these C-shaped rings of cartilage that are called the tracheal cartilages. And the C, the open part of the C, is towards the back. Now this is because at the back of the trachea is where the esophagus is. And you don't want a completely hard tube all the way around because if you swallow a large gulp of food, it, that having the um, esophagus up against the back of the trachea, if the trachea was hard, the food could actually get lodged. So the back of the trachea is filled in with muscle and ligaments so that there's a little bit of wiggle room so that you can swallow and get big swallows of food passed. The ends of each of the tracheal cartilages then at the ends of the C are connected to each other around the back by an annular ligament and the trachealis muscle. So down the back of the trachea, we don't have the, rig the rigid hyaline cartilage rings. Instead, we just have ligaments and muscle. So here's a front view. So the trachea begins here, right below the cricoid cartilage. It goes down through the mediastinum. And then down here at the bottom, it splits into the left primary bronchus and the right primary bronchus. Now this says main bronchi, but primary is the word we're gonna use. And then the next branches that come off are called the secondary bronchi. There's one, two, three secondary, one, two, I guess here, secondary bronchi, because this is the primary bronchus, two secondaries. And then these would be tertiary bronchi. So primary, secondary, tertiary. The textbook is going to use other terms, but that's what I, the ones I want you to learn. Okay, so there's the front, and here's a cross section. So here's that C-shaped cartilage. Here's the esophagus, and across the back here, where the C ends, we have our trachealis muscle and our annular ligament. And that gives us some flexibility so that a large amount of food could not be squashed and get stuck. Okay, so again, we have the primary bronchi, and this is where the, the text and the lab book kind of go different ways. Instead of going, we're gonna call these primary instead of main, and instead of low bar, we're gonna call those secondary, and then we're gonna call segmental ones tertiary. It just means first, second, and third. Much easier than having to learn main, low bar, and segmental. And then each segmental bronchus is gonna go down to a bronchopulmonary segment the right lung has 10 and the left lung has eight or nine. Okay, now at the bottom of the trachea, there is a ridge that separates the openings of the right and left primary bronchi, and it's at their junction with the trachea. And the interesting thing is the, ri the ridge is positioned inside so that if anything does make it down into the bottom of the um, trachea and starts to go into a primary bronchus, it is cheated high so that it would fall into the right bronchus. So instead of falling to the left side, the carina actually forces things to go down into the right lung rather than the left. So again, the carina is an internal structure in here. It's a ring that sits up in the inside and it kind of sits up high and makes things fall more often to the right side than the left side. Okay, so here are the lungs. Now, there are differences between the right lung and the left lung. There's a difference in size and in lobes and in shape. Now, we just finished the unit that had the heart in it, and we know that the heart is primarily cheated to the left side. So the left lung has a cutout where the heart would sit up against it, known as the cardiac notch. We're not gonna have that on the right lung because the heart's not over there. Also notice that the Right lung has one, two, three segments. These are called lobes. So we have three lobes to the right lung and only two lobes to the left lung. And this is showing you how the secondary and tertiary bronchi split up and go to those different 
lobes and bronchopulmonary segments. Okay, so looking at the, the um, respiratory tree, we go again, trachea to primary bronchus, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and then they'll get smaller and smaller and smaller bronchi until we get to bronchioles, and terminal bronchioles lead to respiratory bronchioles, which are directly attached to the alveoli in the pulmonary lobule. So each of these little beads is an alveolus, and together they cluster around a respiratory bronchiole to make a pulmonary lobule. There's a big model of a pulmonary lobule. There's a video of me going over that model. And there's also a diagram that we're going to see in the chapter that pretty much matches that same um, model. It kind of looks like this, okay? So here is our respiratory bronchiole coming down. And then each of these is an alveolus. And we clustered the alveoli together. And we would have a respiratory bronchiole that leads to them. And then we'll have this area here where we're having the air come in and out into this cluster. And that is called the alveolar duct. And then in the center of the cluster, where we kind of have open sacs in the middle, these are this area is called the alveolar sac. And then each one of these is an alveolus, or together they're alveoli. Now, here is a big difference. Um, Mr. Long and, and Mr. Wood, on the model, it kind of has these three areas here, and they do not call them the parietal pleural, pleural cavity, and visceral pleura on the model in the lab. Instead, they think this is the visceral pleura, and then we're, they are naming the layers of elastic tissue okay so on the lab practical i will go with this interpretation of the outer layers of that model where it's parietal pleural pleural cavity and visceral pleura and i will make sure that the answers on my lab exams for my students reflect it, that if you get that question and i point this out in the video too okay so here's some other really cool features there's smooth muscle on the outside of the terminal bronchiole and a little bit on the respiratory bronchiole and we also have our a capillary beds, right? This is where the exchange is going to happen. So these are the alveolar capillaries. We also have elastic fibers on the outside of the alveoli to help them spring back. So they're golden threads on, and um, the golden threads are the smooth muscle, and then we have some black elastic fibers on the model too. So make sure you watch that video. It'll help explain this a bit better. And this is a photomicrograph through a lobule. So an alveolar sac is this area here where they're opening up into the center. This is an alveolar duct. Okay, so bronchi. Bronchial structure. The walls of the three bronchi that we're going to discuss, primary, secondary, and tertiary, get less and less cartilage as we get smaller, but more and more smooth muscle. Now the smooth muscle is going to affect the diameter of the bronchioles and the bronchi and their resistance to airflow. So if you've heard of or ever experienced the condition known as bronchitis, this is when these particular airways are inflamed and swollen and it gets hard to breathe because we have, when they swell, they swell towards the lumen. So we have less air room in each of these passageways. The bronchi will go eventually down into bronchioles. Bronchioles will go into terminal bronchioles. And then bro terminal bronchioles will become respiratory bronchioles. Bronchioles have no cartilage. Instead, they are completely surrounded on the outside by smooth muscle. Okay, so the autonomic nervous system controls how big the diameter of bronchioles is by regulating the smooth muscle on the outside. So if the muscle constricts, the bronchioles are going to have a smaller diameter. It gets harder to breathe. If the muscle is relaxed, the bronchioles have a larger diameter. It is easier to breathe. So people who have a panic attack, the sympathetic nervous system causes bronchioles to constrict and makes it harder to breathe. People who have asthma have a, a mistaken tightening, constricting of these airways. So what an inhaler does is it goes the opposite way. It forces these airways to relax. 
So, excuse me, I got it backwards. Bronchodilation is caused by sympathetic activation. Bronchoconstriction is caused by parasympathetic activation and histamine release. So it gets fluidy and it gets smaller. I do apologize. Sorry. Bronchodilation is sympathetic activation. An inhaler is actually usually a form of epinephrine, which we know is a sympathetic neurotransmitter, and that causes them to open. So you can use an inhaler to cause that muscle to relax. Asthma, excessive stimulation of smooth muscles, causing severe bronchoconstriction, which restricts airflow. Okay, each terminal bronchial branches to form lots of respiratory bronchioles, and then they become alveolar ducts. The alveolar ducts lead down to alveolar sacs, and at the alveolar sac is where we have all of the individual alveoli attached. These are common chambers to, attached to many individual alveoli. And each alveolus has an extensive network, network of capillaries surrounded by elastic fibers. So this is where we're getting down to this model again. So here's my respiratory bronchiole. You can see the smooth muscle on the outside. And then it branches and becomes an alveolar duct inside. And the alveolar duct leads to the alveolar sac. And all of these alveoli are attached to this open chamber. And each one of these is an alveolus. Here is my capillaries and we see the bands of elastic tissue. And here is a photomicrograph. This one um, was one we used to show you in lab or have you look at in lab. I'm not sure if this one's gonna show up on the next lab test, it might. So notice that these long stretches where we have nothing are the alveolar ducts. And then when it widens out and becomes more circular, that becomes the alveolar sac. So this will be the alveolar duct. Here's the alveolar sac, alveolar, alveolar duct, alveolar sac. And this big one up here, they're calling a respiratory bronchial. So we've been doing all of this talking to get down to these guys, the alveoli. And so there are two kinds of cells that form the alveoli. We have simple squamous epithelium and most of the cells that form the walls of each alveolus are called pneumocytes type one. They are the one where we're using them to get oxygen from the environment to the bloodstream. So they are the site of gas exchange. And because this is a source of possible infection, they are patrolled by their own kind of macrophages, alveolar macrophages. So these are forming the walls of the alveoli. Between the alveoli, there are going to be another type of cells that are large, not nearly as delicate, and they are called pneumocytes type two, and they produce surfactant. Now what is surfactant? Surfactant is a chemical that is a lubricating chemical. So it's going to surround the outside and inside of each of these alveolar sacs so that when the air leaves, the two sides or walls of the sac don't seal against each other. Have you ever blown up a balloon and then let the air out, but you got a little spit in the balloon and it like stuck itself on the inside? If you put more fluid in that balloon, the two sides can't get stuck together. And that's what surfactant does for us. So here's a diagram. So most of these cells here are going to be my pneumocytes type 1 because they're forming the wall of the alveolus. And then these ones are the pneumocyte type 2s that make surfactant. So surfactant is an oily secretion made of phospholipids and proteins, and it coats the alveolar surface to reduce surface tension. Respiratory distress syndrome is when those alveoli do not secrete enough surfactant to keep them open, and every time you exhale, the alveoli actually collapse and stick to each other. And this can be caused by not enough surfactant due to injury or genetic abnormalities. Another time surfactant is really important is when a baby is going to be born prematurely. Surfactant is one of the very, very last things to be developed in the baby. And so sometimes if they know that a woman is very likely to deliver early, they will go ahead and give her medications to speed up the development of surfactant in the baby. Otherwise, the baby can have respiratory distress syndrome when it's born and has to be completely on a breathing machine. Okay, so we're getting into the nitty gritty here. We're all the way down at the alveoli, and this is where the exchange is going to occur. So we have air in the alveolus, and then we have the wall of the alveolus, the wall of the capillary, and then we have the blood. So we're going to call this thing the blood-air barrier. 
So the air has to get, the oxygen has to get through the alveolar cell layer, through the capillary endothelial layer, and through the basement membrane. That's one single basement membrane between these two cell layers. So here is our blood side inside the capillary. Okay, here is our air space. Here's the alveolus wall. Here's the capillary wall. There's the glue layer. So it is about 0.5 micrometers. And by the way, a micrometer is itty bitty 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 bitty. Okay, and this is what makes our alveolar blood, or excuse me, our blood air barrier between the alveolar air space and the capillary lumen. Now we want this to be quick and efficient, and it is because the distance is short and because both oxygen, O2, and carbon dioxide, CO2, are small and lipid soluble. So why is this important? They don't have to go through slits or pores or channels. They can actually go through the cell's membranes. So we don't have to transport them. They are naturally gonna flow just like there were no barriers between them. Now you notice pneumocytes started with PN, EU. That's our prefix that lets us know we're inside the lung. And so you may have heard of the condition called pneumonia. This is an inflammation of this alveolar lung tissue that causes fluid to get inside the alveoli. Now, oxygen cannot travel nearly as well from an air space to a watery space and then get across the blood air barrier into the capillary. And also, this fluid takes the place of the air that would fill up the alveolus. So it compromises the function of the blood air barrier and the ability to get enough oxygen out to your body. That's why pneumonia is such a dangerous infection. Okay, left and right lungs, each are in their own pleural cavity and they have a bottom part that is actually called the base this time. I know the base of the heart was the headquarters, the base of the lung is the bottom and the bottom of each lung actually sits on the diaphragm muscle. And then we have the lobes of the lungs, which are separated by deep fissures. So since the right lung has three lobes, a superior lobe, a middle lobe, and an inferior lobe, it must have two fissures. And it has a horizontal fissure and an oblique fissure. The left lung only has two lobes, so it only needs one fissure. It has a superior lobe and an inferior lobe, so it only has one oblique fissure. So the horizontal fissure is what gives the right lung its middle lobe. The right lung is wider than the left lung, but it's also a little bit higher than the left lung because the liver takes up so much room on the right side. The left lung is longer than the right lung and it's missing a little notch on the inside because of where the heart goes, so that's called the cardiac notch. Now, the, what we called the base in the heart was the headquarters because it was where all the blood vessels came in and out. Because the base of the lung is the bottom of the lung that sits on the diaphragm, we had to use a different word for the headquarters. And the word that we're going to use is hilum. And this is not going to be the only organ we see that has a hilum. So the hilum is where the important conducting things are coming in and out. So we're going to have pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins, and the bronchial tree entering and exiting the lung at the hilum, okay? Where the pulmonary vessels, nerves, and lymphatics enter, and the root of the lung, which is in the hilum, is a bunch of dense connective tissue, nerves, and vessels in the hilum anchored to the mediastinum. Okay, so here's our little diagram. Here are the cadaver lungs. These are really kind of hard to see. I'm not real impressed with this picture. I'd rather see this diagram. So, this is the right lung from the front, or first, excuse me, from the side, superior lobe, middle lobe, inferior lobe, horizontal fissure, oblique fissure. Remember, oblique is at an angle. Here's the left lung from the side. It has a superior lobe and an inferior lobe and an oblique fissure. There's my cardiac notch. There is the base. At the top, we have a little point for each lung. That is called the apex of the lung. And now if we look at the medial side, okay, this is the hilum of the lung. So we can see our pulmonary artery, our pulmonary veins, and our primary and secondary bronchi are all in here. So the hilum is the groove that allows these things to enter and exit. And here is another cadaver model. Okay, this time we have a, a transverse section. 
<clears throat> you can actually see the heart here, and then here's the two lungs. Right lung, left lung, because his belly is up, by the way. Okay. Trabeculae are these fibrous, elastic, fibrous, smooth muscles and vessels that are dividing up the lungs, and they divide it up into lobules. Sometimes they're called the interlobular septa. We also have our two pleural cavities that are separated by another area called the mediastinum. Each pleural cavity has a lung, and each pleural membrane has two layers. I know this has been drilled into your head to death. The outer wall is created by the parietal pleura, which is up against the inner surface of the thoracic wall. And the surface of the lung itself has the visceral pleura. It's on the outside of the lung. And they both secrete pleural fluid between them, which lubricates the space and allows the lungs to inflate and deflate. All right. Respiration is two different processes that happen in our side, our respiratory system. We have external respiration and internal respiration. External respiration is everything that involves us bringing in oxygen and putting out CO2, exchanging it with the external environment. So where does this happen? Where do we exchange with the external environment? That happens at the lungs and the blood air barrier. Internal respiration is when the cells of the body take up oxygen and release CO2. So where does this happen? Well, we just said the cells do it. So this has to happen out, out in the capillary beds around the cells, right? It's happening inside the cells. So internal respiration is what's happening from the capillary to the interstitial fluid. So, in order to have external respiration, we must have pulmonary ventilation, which we just call breathing. We must have gas diffusion. First, it has to go across the blood air barrier and then across the capillary walls out to the tissue. We have transport of oxygen and CO2 between the capillaries and between capillary beds in other tissues. So, respiration external is really where the lungs come into play, okay? Internal respiration happens out in the tissues, inside the cells. Okay, so pulmonary ventilation is the act of breathing. It's moving air into and out of your tract and it provides the alveoli with their ventilation. And an important concept here is atmospheric pressure. So the air around you has a certain amount of pressure based on all of the gases that are in it. And it's at, one atmosphere is actually 760 millimeters of mercury. So when we're going to start talking about gas pressures, we're going to talk about laws that say that the total air pressure outside of your body is made up of the pressures of all the individual gases, like the pressures of oxygen, of nitrogen, of CO2. All of those have their own individual pressure. And when the pressure exceeds inside your chest, uh, what's, at, what's in the atmosphere exceeds what's inside your chest, then the pressure from the atmosphere pu pushes air into your lungs. When the chamber of your chest has air pressure higher than the atmosphere, then you're going to push air out of your lungs. Okay? So this is a lead-in to the next video, which is the difference between respiration and ventilation. So I'll pick up the next video with slide 76.